I like conversation. I think that's where we should all live as humans. Where that's where we're meant to live as relational beings, and we we're getting further and further away from that. As in a in a world where media is frequently not about conversation, it's about confrontation and and dialogue. Having real, are you willing to have a conversation about this controversial topic? Sure, I am. Yeah, I'm totally open-minded about this. I, okay, thanks. Have a nice day. Um, and I, I don't do confrontation well. There's a great line that's used. I don't know if you know about the recovery called Al-Anon, but there's a great line that people who are in Al-Anon use, which is part of kind of Alcoholics Anonymous. When there's something going on, one one line that's always really valuable is, "You could be right." move on yeah it just yeah i'm not gonna because I, I i've believed in for years that you can prove in healthcare anything you want to prove diametrically opposed stances in medicine can be proved with enough research literature and yeah obviously i'm here because of your interaction when i i guess that's it, it one of the things was my background. We can decide whether or not we'll talk about that. And I like the points that you sent, Millie. It's just how did we connect? Because it wasn't for a product. It was yeah. through the whole thing you did with Nick Dogris and QEG. And that gets into kind of one of the topics or questions when you had said, during your career, technology has changed a lot. What have you noticed with the rapid change, especially in recent years? And I break that up into two things. Technology is not the evil per thing in the world. Technology is absolutely incredible, but so is nuclear energy. As they say, it can empower the world and destroy the world. Yeah. But you saw what QEG, which has been around for decades, it's an incredibly useful bedside tool that we can use to analyze the brain anywhere in the world with a computer, laptop, some solar power, it's not a big deal, and do quantitative analysis to see what's going on inside people's brains. Functionally, that correlates with their lives, because if people were fine, F-I-N-E, then you wouldn't need to be in business. I wouldn't be doing healthcare, but unfortunately, none of us are really fine. Do you all know what fine stands for? No, nope. Matt, you don't know this. <laughs> when people most, how often? How are you doing? Oh, fine. You know, it's uh, like it's in, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing fine. Doing good. That's not the right answer. It's fine means I won't say what F stands for. You know, fricked up, insane, <laughs> neurotic, emotionally unstable. <clears throat> Sounds and right. Most of us are struggling with different things. And we can go to our clinician, our doctor, I'm struggling with this and that, and they do some tests, your tests are normal, everything's fine. Well, that doesn't help. So let's have dialogue. And that's what got me here. When I saw the QEG, you do that with Nick, and you could see with the device, the technology, yeah. without how in this increasingly saturated electromagnetic world, which has been increasing for 200 years, is how are we going to stay safe and it to me it's the same common sense that we use with sunscreen if you don't think this over exposure to the sun is a problem why would i get uv sunglasses and why would i wear sunscreen but we've kind of been inundated with that so now we slather our kids and ourselves in sunscreen which itself has its own problems so yeah I love that you kind of took that question as that technology has its benefits and also its, you know, negatives. Um, so definitely when we talk about that, I would love for you to highlight that a little bit more and talk about the EEG and QEG um, mm -hmm. from your perspective. Okay. I, I think let's jump in, let's get started. And I think let's start with just like your background. Also, I feel like we should address you as Dr. Turner. Does that sound? fair appropriate or do you prefer us to say robert or how would you like us to address you i don't know i guess if it's going to be posted maybe you know me i don't like the doctor I, thing but you've earned it 
Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One eight hundred right? coma. Right. Okay. I, I, we'll 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 address you, as Dr. Turner, for the interview, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to to call you Robert or Rusty when we're when we're not interviewing you, interviewing you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Millie, once you kick it off, and and uh, we'll we'll roll. Great. So we're here with Dr. Turner. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, in the background, you can see some books here. And I, so but my background, I'm sitting here at a, a crucial point in my career, excited for the future. I, I think we've all grown up hearing this when you're 65, you're supposed to retire and do this and that and the other thing. And I'm right on the cusp of 65. And I love what I've, I've loved what I've been doing most of my career. I, Grew up in the Midwest and had a nice, healthy upbringing and actually studied languages and music. That was my background. And I have a passion. Started piano when I was three or four years old and studied graduate piano when I was in medical school. And then during college, decided I, there's no way I could be a world class musician that would make it and survive in the world. And I, I wanted to do that because I could use languages and go anywhere in the world. and I thought now, and I realized my not wanting to go into healthcare was partly a reactivity against my dad, who was an incredible father, a pediatrician, and I just didn't want to be seen following daddy's footsteps and other weird, deep Freudian things or something. And uh, once I got into the music world and languages, I said, I don't want to hang around with music weirdos. And then I chose to hang around with doctor weirdos. So here we are. So. And I think we're maybe a little more dysfunctional. But we all we all come from one happy. We're the ones that put the fun in dysfunctional. You've heard that statement before. So went to medical school planning to do geriatrics because I worked in nursing homes, things like that in high school and loved, loved it. You know, here I am, one of them, but that's another story 40 years later. And when I got on pediatrics and was more and more around kids with developmental issues, neurological, it was like, this is what was what I was made for. And so I went into the neurology track, did pediatric training, did neurology training, then did a couple fellowships in neurophysiology, electro, EMG, epilepsy, that whole thing. And then started my career working in what I hope has been a career in healthcare. Just one aside is we introduce ourselves. I'm your healthcare provider, whatever. I'm Dr. So and so. And this is not so much my background, but it's just some of my biases is that we are trying to do the best we can being healthcare providers. But much of the time today, we're so busy. We're so behind the eight ball. We're so busy catching up where there's so many fires we're putting out. We're disease managers. We're trying to patch up the hole in the Titanic. We're trying to straighten the deck chairs while the, the boat is, is listing and we're just missing it. And I don't want to be just a disease manager that's doling out prescriptions to control symptoms that we're not getting to the root of or cutting out things that maybe don't need to be cut out, things like that. So, And that's kind of the traditional approach with incredible allopathic medicine medications and surgery. And those are essential. They help. But we know now well across the, the panorama that chronic health care, we're not doing a good job. And particularly with pharmacologic interventions, because our bodies aren't made to use the same thing long term pharmacologically, because we are, and I guess that's a foundational point that shaped my whole career, and that deals with one of the other things you mentioned, Millie, how did I discover EMF, EMR? But we are electromagnetic beings. That's the way we're created. I think we're created spirit, soul, and body. But that electromagnetic, our brains are electromagnetic, our cardiovascular system, our GI system, musculoskeletal. So it should come as no surprise that we're having problems in an increasingly saturated electromagnetic world, man-made or, or 
person made, whatever the, I want to have the correct terms, but created electromagnetic, which we'll touch on maybe sometime in a little bit, but can be good. There's, there's pulsed elect PEMF and electromagnetics for bone healing that were Dr. Becker and others discovered back in the 60s and 70s. But the way most of EMF, and that's where you're experts with this, is influencing us adversely. So, well, the, you, uh, you, you covered a long career in only a few minutes. And so I have a, I have a couple of questions to follow up on there. Just kind of, I'm curious. I'm curious on the connection with music and neurology and kind of any of that overlapping, um, I don't know, interest that, that you found there or in the relationship, maybe music to neurology. I don't, I don't even know what the right question is to ask there, but there seems like there's something there. And I'm curious, just by me putting those two things together, what is your response? Mm. All, all of our electromagnetics have musical qualities. Music is frequency, just at different parts along that whole scale, just like what we see in the visual spectrum here in the audio spectrum are different parts of that. I don't know when it, I do know when it came together. I, I decided I didn't want to finish my studies, although I worked on my master's in piano in med school, but I loved it. It was part of what I enjoyed doing and still enjoy doing and still get to play occasionally at a restaurant downtown and stuff fun like that. But many pivotal points or what I call them, wake up from the matrix points in my career come from frustration, not from everything's going well. And particularly my commitment through my career working with people with seizures and epilepsy we are doing the best we can in healthcare, but the majority of people in the world are not cured or seizure free from their epilepsy or seizures by our traditional allopathic treatments. Medications, the typical quote, medications work two thirds of the time. Anyway, I, I was always more interested, no, that's a bad way to put it. I was always more challenged. I was glad to see people when they went on an anti-seizure medicine and they were doing great. That, you just do it, you prescribe what you hope is the right medicine based on the findings, you pray it's gonna work, and then you come back and wait. I mean, it's literally Tylenol for the fever without getting at the root of it. But what takes up so much of our time, the Pareto principle and all the 80% of our time is taking up with, you know, 20% of the, whatever that, you know more about that. So that's probably not a good quote, Matt. Um, but looking at, what else should we be doing? If drugs and surgery worked, no, we wouldn't be, need to have any more discussions, but they don't work for the majority of people with seizures and epilepsy, and they're not working for the majority of people with a lot of other disorders in today's world. And so uh, at, at that point, I stumbled onto the work of Dr. John Hughes in Chicago, University of Chicago, who's an incredible neurologist and epileptologist who first published early in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, called the Mozart effect, which of course has been popularized and put down by a lot of healthcare people. But it, again, it shouldn't surprise us that music, which is transcultural, all kinds of things is incredible. And he looked at it in people with epilepsy. So that set me on looking at other adjunctive things that we can use, in a, especially when medicines aren't working and surgery is not an option or not necessary. And so interacted with him and ended up doing five clinical, four or five clinical trials on the non-linear effects of music on the brain, not just music therapy and how enjoyable music is, which is incredible. Music therapy is really important, but the non-linear effects of music on the brain. And he'd studied that very systematically and showed that it helped people with seizures in certain ways. And so that's why I led and did it's, that's kind of the blending of research and career. Yeah. You're integrated, but I wanted to go further because if you mention to somebody in a visit in an academic center that you want to recommend that they listen to a particular Mozart piece or something in music, you go, oh, that's sweet. Okay, now when are we going to do the big stuff? But it really made a difference. And I wrote down a line, it made, it was good, but not good enough. And so that's how it interacted. And it was kind of cool after a, a, a life of music, 
that it blended. And there's a yeah. huge amount of literature and books over the last, many decades on music and the brain. Yeah. And musicality. So a long answer to your question, Joss, but that's how the music came in. And I continue that, but it was good, but it wasn't good enough. It did. We could demonstrate it improved and in fact in some situations normalized the EEG but many people it didn't or didn't do it good enough what else could we do in addition yeah. to that and that led into the whole looking in neuromodulation quantitative EEG neurofeedback which are also incredible tools for brain health to get the brain healthier and that's part of what I presented at the ILA meeting in Geneva was neurofeedback in, in people with epilepsy but again, those are all up here, and the, this gradual waking up of this rumbling was electromagnetic. We are electromagnetic beings. We live in an electromagnetic world, the kind of the matrix, and it's becoming increasingly evident and toxic, electropollution, whatever terms people like to use. And that, the deeper I started looking into that, it was, oh my this is huge and it's nothing i discovered you know the history it's there yeah it's the it's the biggest invisible elephant in the room with most medical mental health providers whatever we're doing that you can't see it touch it smell it taste it here you know those although some people can with particular electromagnetic hypersensitivity um Boy, what was the question? But yeah, that's well, how kind of we, evolved. We, we jumped off with music in the in yeah. the neurology relationship there. Um, I'm gonna wrap up this background, and it seems like in our previous conversation, uh, because we were trying to nail down a time that we could actually have this interview, you were traveling around to some some different hospitals and clinics working with uh, young people. The what what is the main where does Modus your energy go right now as far as your your work goes? Good. Yeah. I'm having in many ways more fun now than I have most of my career. And not just because I get to talk to you guys. That's pretty fun <laughs> and cool uh, with the, you know, spending time with the old guy. It, it So with the onset, with COVID, I had a, an integrative neuroscience practice here in South Carolina that I love doing comprehensive brain health because that's what we should be doing is brain health and had that and that closed at COVID. It's, and I, I lived in the world of thinking I could operate a practice successfully in the insurance world on people's behalf. And we have a, a probably one of the countries with the highest GMP with healthcare expenditure and it doesn't work real well. And of course, many, many of the kids I see have Medicaid, which is an incredible system to help, but it's great for the families. It just doesn't. Anyway, so the practice closed and we've gotten all the fam distraught families redistributed. But I continued, it, it actually was it, the way it all started happening before COVID. I was already doing a lot of online work. And so what I do now is a lot of online work and mentoring and consulting with people around the world, clinicians, talking about brain health, talking about EEG quantitative EEG, that assessment that you got a taste of when you met with Nick Douglas. And I read EEGs for a lot of people all over. So so I do that kind of every day to variable amounts in a very, I think, healthy way. And then once a month or so, there's a I, I travel to work at a hospital to help where there's a shortage of pediatric neurologists, which is pretty much all over the world. There's a short, it's not an incredibly well populated specialty, and the needs are increasing all the time, which is another thing that I presented at the, the I, ILA stands for International League Against Epilepsy. They had what was called the European Epilepsy Conference. It was the 14th annual, this one was in Geneva, but that electromagnetic radiation is probably one of the biggest factors responsible for increasing problems we're seeing in kids prenatally onward with seizures, developmental problems. So the hospitals are busy. There's a desperate need for pediatric neurologists. So I go into a hospital. I fly, like I've 
on to Nebraska, Gillette. I'll be going to the Cleveland Clinic, the, the Rainbows in a few months, and help work in the hospital. And the hospitals are bigger than ever before. They're fuller than ever before with kids who are sicker than ever before. And it's not just because we're better diagnosing. We have a sicker society and we it's it's like triage work is how it kind of feels to me much. We bring people in from the front lines, they get sent to the triage hospital, we patch them up and send them back out. And we come into a hospital, which as you know, is one of the most saturated electromagnetic environments that we can be in, totally oblivious that that that's not helping the problem. So yeah. I again, Gillette, I, I go to Minnesota and do that once a month. And then I've been helping at our local teaching hospital here periodically once a month and sometimes less helping on the inpatient. So yeah. I get to teaching, try to help work with families and educate, and then get people to say, you know, we may not need to keep doing the same thing over and over, inspecting different results. Yeah. Where if you've seen this recurrent problem, then maybe we can get to the bottom of it. So many more questions. Uh, and yeah. I know Millie has a little bit of an outline. Well, um, I don't know if Josh or Matt's going to do this. I mean, I don't do sound bites very well. You can imagine. You've done fantastic. Yeah. That, I but, do great with an elevator speech if the building's 150 stories tall. <laughs> We're similar in that way, and I'm I'm doing my best just to hold back. But I'm like I have so many things to follow up on. Please uh, do. Just, I love doing this, and this is yeah. I'm really fascinated uh, by the the work you're doing with with uh, children and kids and young people. And I wanted to ask specifically, and you know, as it relates to to e EMF, EMR. Which, by the way, which which. Uh, which setup do you like better, EMF, EMR? And it, do you do you, when you explain that to people, do you explain them differently? Yeah, I explain the terms because I say you'll see EMF, electromagnetic frequency. Everything is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, EMF. When I was privileged to interact with Magda Havis and some others that have been mm -hmm. instrumental in this field for, as you know, for decades, the I think the more correct term is electromagnetic radiation. Yeah. But people don't want to hear that. We people don't, don't want to hear. It. We've learned that as well. We exactly. we have that discussion all the time because you use the word radiation and it has that instant, you know, negative connotation to it, uh, which, you know, can be great when you're really trying to emphasize a point, but you also don't want to, you know, strike a ton of fear into people, but it is, and it is really radiation. It is. And, yeah. and you're not, we have a problem worldwide with fear. It's it's the right. big pandemic. It's right. pervasive, and fear is killing people in many ways. And that's what I think many social systems bank on. Media banks on fear. We don't call it that in order to get you to do this. Your your goal with Aries Tech is not to fear people into buying your product. Right. That's not the issue. It's to get people to understand. Here's a tool that can help as I revamp my whole approach to health. Yeah. And it's the same thing like with neurofeedback, which I've devoted the last 10, 15 years to, which is incredible. It's basically simple brain training, like going to the gym for exercise. But there's this incredible bias in my profession. Neuromodulation, that's the term I use mm -hmm. because everything we do neuromodulates. Okay. Neurofeedback is part of that. So often neurofeedback, sorry, you know, closed minded, yeah. that doesn't work. And so the EMF is fine, and, and I'm yeah. happy to use that and then explain people it's all part of it or radio yeah. RF radio frequency. I, you know, we've started to just say, you know, EMR is the better term for the conversation that we most frequently have, but EMF mm -hmm. seems to be more popular because yeah. I think it has more meanings. There's more people playing in that kind of world of EMF readers, and there's just a lot going on there. So I think that term was just earlier and more widely like accepted, but EMR, again, we have that debate all the time because we don't really want to prey on fear, but right. you can't avoid that that word. So, um, well, going back to what I was gonna say, I want to kind of kind of recap and summarize kind of where, where we are at this point, which is doing a lot of work with epilepsy and seizures, specifically with children, or are you still working with adults too, or is it mostly with children? No, it, also with adults, 
and it, it the the, power, the the amount of my work involved with people with seizures and the acronym throughout this is a bit of a, a tangent you know me in tangents but is people with epilepsy or people okay. with seizures and i'm a a big proponent we've actually probably for 15 20 years tried to rid the world of the term epileptic it's a horrible okay. term it's label and i i don't think you even did it and some people, they're, when they're doing it, they're not doing it meanly, but don't label somebody by their disease. Their condition, yeah. yeah. I don't call somebody a hepatitic or, uh, I don't know. That is interesting because you say hepatitic and we la kind of chuckle. It's like, that seems odd, yeah. but you're oh, exactly proving your point. And we do diabetic all the time. No, this is a person with diabetes. Yeah. And that's another tangent when you go back and look at the increased incidence of in prevalence of diabetes the last 150 years tied in with the history of electricity. It's, it's another story. Yeah. So where was I going with that one? So the term, uh, so 10, 15% maybe of my work involves people with seizures and epilepsy. Okay. P P W E I'll use that sometimes in publications and teaching people with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the international term. And one other good trend that I really like to finally see at this meeting last week uh, was talking about ASM. And this won't be a focus so much here, but anti-seizure medicine. For many years, people have called them anti-epileptic drugs, AEDs. Mm. And they, the problem is they are not anti-epileptic. They're not reversing the epilepsy process. It's, the, it, it's like when you take acetaminophen or ibuprofen, it might be an anti-pyretic. Mm -hmm. You're trying to fight the fever. You're not treating the infection. So they're called anti-seizure medicines because they're not affecting the underlying epilepsy process. And that makes sense to me, which is why I've committed so much continued work to that especially with EMF, because we know worldwide now for the last 10, 12 years, epilepsy is an electromagnetic disease of the neural networks. And that should wake us up to say, it's great when a medicine works, but we shouldn't be surprised that medicines aren't the cure. Yeah. And so there's adverse effects, and that I think is definitely accounting for the increased incidence of younger and younger seizures in kids. When I go to the hospitals, the amount of kids that get admitted daily, even from one or two weeks after birth now with seizures is unprecedented. I guess that's a buzzword to what, and it's not just lack of memory from my training and if you talk to any intensive care physician, any ER physician, hospitalists doing their work, even probably office practice, it's there's the, the level of acuity is much higher, the complexity and the refractory nature, how many aren't responding to the medicines. And when you see, so getting back to what you mentioned, much of my work, my career has been as a pediatric neurologist, we train the same, so I have training as an adult neurologist. I just choose not to do that full yeah. time. I do see a lot of adults, particularly with special needs and things, because I go to developmental centers in South Carolina where adults with neurological, neurodevelopmental, intellectual dis disability things, problems grow up and live. So I get to still deal with the whole age group. And the other thing with EMF, it applies from before birth throughout the lifespan and yeah. many many things being blamed on old age decline cognitive decline today just because people are getting older absolutely has to do with the influence of emf but also our gut the brain gut connection our lack of moving around and exercise, our unhealthy sleep environments, which you deal with, we've got to be in an electromagnetically healthy sleep environment. Okay, here we are, somewhere over here. Where'd we get, bring us back in, Josh. I'll let Millie rein us back in because I'll just keep asking questions, so. Yeah, no, I think that point is actually a good kind of 
leeway into what I wanted to talk about next because we've already kind of covered, you know, how you discovered EMF and EMR and how it plays a role in your career. Um, but I think what you just talked about with the environmental factors having an effect, um, like you said, prenatally as well as throughout a person's lifetime, um, kind of leads into like, why is it a concern for specific sensitive groups um, mm -hmm. as well as the general population? That's a big question. Yeah, and, if you want to break it up, we can talk about like sensitive groups first yeah. well, and then and we can talk about the general population. I was just going to add, you know, one thing that we come up against a lot is the majority of the population as it relates to, you know, EMF, they don't have a negative response that they're aware of, right? There's not a, like, I don't, like, and, and, and actually the people may, but they aren't making the connection either that it's, that it's their, their, you know, the electricity or the, you know, the, the, the fields around them. Um, so what do you say to, let's say the majority of the population who isn't respond, like doesn't have a, an acute response to, or negative response? Acute or chronic response. Right, to, right. Because we're missing much of, if it's acute radiation poisoning, oh, that's well classified. Yeah. But, one thing that you mentioned, Millie, how did I discover? And I like to think it discovered me. It's been around. It had been knocking on the door my whole life, my whole career. And then more and more was like, oh, this is part of the problem. So how do you, since I, I use two analogies, I don't know if they're the greatest analogies. Most people who drive vehicles don't get in accidents. If you get in an accident, it was like, this car, I'm never driving again. The car is the problem, whatever. We can single it out. So the other bigger analogy that is a little bit closer is going out in the sun. Most people go out in the sun. Some people do a whole lot more than others. Not everybody who goes in the sun gets some type of skin-related disease or skin cancer. And so there's individual susceptibilities that we intuitively understand about many things but we lose it, well, EMF's not affecting me, so it's not a problem. Well, a war isn't affecting me right now here where I'm sitting in South Carolina, so it's not a problem. It's like the doubting Thomas, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. Yeah. But I think that's one of the analogies I use. And the problem with sunlight is it's got its influence, but we come inside. Uh, or we wear now we the people that had to go through the scientists that developed and discovered sunscreens were heretics they were crazy i mean what they had to go through to finally get people to realize maybe we should protect our skin now we take it for granted you know and um so i think that's how i explain it is we're different human beings and we have different susceptibility and I use sometimes as an example, I, I grew up, I rarely, in the Midwest, summertime, nice hot summers going out and playing and doing all that. I rarely, if ever, took off my shirt. I just didn't like to do that. And then 15 years ago, I show up with a melanoma in the middle of my back. So that's not like you can point to that one place. So there's so many undetected factors that lead to susceptibility. And unfortunately, many people with more sensitive or who are experiencing more symptoms and they start looking at electromagnetism as or electromagnetic frequency as, as that like electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome or electrical hypersensitivity, EHS, that's mm -hmm. much more well described with Dr. Belpalm and oh, my colleague in Israel, others, it's if you don't recognize it or you go to a clinician who either knows nothing about it or chooses not to believe what they read, it gets all ignored. And so, uh, and then we end up treating the anxiety or the palpitations or whatever, and we miss it. So I don't know if that addressed part of it, but there's, it shouldn't surprise us that there's segments of the population that are more sens sensitive to certain things. We know that with ethnic differences, we know that with 
geographical differences, socioeconomic differences that that manifest differently with, that's why we have often different ethnic breakdown in lab publications. When lab results come, they sometimes divide those out between ethnic background. And I always talk about ethnicity. I, I believe there's one race, the human race. We're all one homo sapien sapien, where there's not different races human wise. So um, yeah. although think, we make a big difference, you would think it's a big deal. Yeah, I think that did cover it a little bit. And so kind of just to recap, what you were saying was obviously people who are in the hospitals that you're working in or even coming to you are kind of seeking out some form of treatment because of symptoms they're having. But other people who are, you know, just going out on their daily lives, not feeling a sensitivity to it, you still say that it's, you know, affecting in other ways. Is that right? Is that like your summary? Yes. When most people know from history about the whole Chernobyl incident, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's happening all over the world, but it took had a lot of attention. Not everybody in that exposure area had similar manifestations or even had manifestations. And probably the six of us or the five of us here interacting, I would suspect we're pretty saturated with EMF, but I'm not aware too much of symptoms of that. And again, as they say, most people who go out in the sun don't get skin cancer. Does that mean the sun's not a problem it, or those people are making up their symptoms? No, it's just we've got to take the time to have a dialogue with people that come to see us and say, ask the Sherlock Holmes questions. How does this all fit together? You, you uh, sorry to interrupt you. Using your son example, I mean, I would assume that 99.9% .9 of people, if they stayed in the sun long enough for extended periods of time, would develop some negative side effect, right? Correct. I think so. And we're talking, you know, with EMF, really what we focus a lot on is the chronic exposure in the on, yeah. like the consistent, ongoing, really always on exposure that most of us have day to day. And, and I guess when we use that same, you know, comparison to the sun, at, at, will everybody eventually ha experience some degradation of the system because of it? It's in, and I don't know how it's going to manifest, probably different, but what, what do you, how do you think about that? I think that's a valid statement. And it's probably having effects in each one of us now, but when does it, when you, you, you put one more breath in the balloon and it pops. There's a critical moment where, oops, that was one too many. The straw that broke the camel's back, that kind of thing. And the difference with EMF, as you know, is it's 24 seven, yeah. especially in the last decade or so with construction where it's everywhere, smart devices, smart cars, smart everything. And the, so the sun is a partial example of that. And I know, you know, people who have, you see them in their sixties and seventies, they were sun worshipers and they've, they've got maybe kind of the worn down skin, yeah. never skin cancer. Yeah. All that didn't wear sunscreen, put copper tone on, I'm sorry, whatever name brand, I don't want to say <laughs> on to get all fried during the summer and, and don't develop skin cancer. This is, the sun is huge. This is so pervasive, so invasive, and so subtle that we're, we are, and that's part of the healthcare prevention is getting people slowly, and you're seeing it worldwide, but probably the majority of people worldwide aren't the ones that are coming to you for information. But it is increasing. You know, there's one website devoted that I think has good stuff called babysafeproject.org okay. yeah. you know, that is with Devra and others that have helped put that together. Like, let's first do no harm, kind of what we were supposed to have been taught back in healthcare training. And the other thing that I 
bring up frequently that I didn't invent, obviously, called the precautionary principle. And as you know, one of the key papers with EMF was back in 2005 that Dr. Kiefitz and colleagues published in Pediatrics, the premier world journal for pediatrics on EMF sensitivity in children. So when you talked about sensitivity groups or those that are more susceptible, there's these people that fit more of an EHS symptom complex, and then there's the de developing nervous system. We know everything is more susceptible in a developing baby, a child. We, we get that, that's intuitive almost in our society. And yet from the EMF standpoint, the, we don't enforce, seriously take those recommendations for to change what we do, what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends regarding screen time. How can you limit screen time to an hour a day when we live on our devices? And how do you put on the blue filters and yeah. um, have devices and go wired rather than wireless or have ways to put an interference? I don't know the right term. Again, I'm still, I'm not fluent with Aries Tech, but I believe that's what attracted me to what you're doing. Again, that's not selling anything, but distance is wonderful. That's the first thing that people can do is be aware and distance from what we're doing. Don't Which is becoming increasingly harder with like, most people can look out their window and see a, a cell phone tower, or maybe a 5G tower, power lines, you electricity in your walls, Wi-Fi routers, your fridge, your smart meter, your watch. Yeah, it's becoming increasingly you know hard. You have to make a very, very deliberate, conscious effort to actually create space. And, and most people aren't willing to do that. Or, or if they were, they'd be doing a lot of other things as well. But the majority of the population are not doing those things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did want to bring up, this is probably a good, we probably should have started here. What are your, there's a lot of research on the potential negative um, uh, side effects or effects of, you know, chronic long-term exposure to EMF. There are a little, there's a lot of work. Actually, I should say long-term. There's not a lot of work on long-term. There is a lot on just like, you know, 10 minute studies, 20 minute studies. There's a lot of work that's about there, but overall there's a, fairly large body of work on the potential side effects of, of, you know, EMR. And there's, doesn't seem to be a consensus in, in the medical field or the engineers that are creating these things. Um, and I don't care necessarily why you don't think that there is, because I think that gets us into an area that's probably not worth our time to, to talk about. But um, I wanted to get, to get from your experience in, in your research, what do you think biologically is happening in the and i think that's where you see a lot of the debate you know a lot of people talk about the sar um rating and then you look at your phone it, it mentions the sar rating uh in its terms and conditions and its its uh warnings um and a lot of people when we have people you know comment on our on our content they talk a lot about the heating of of um you know cells and and things like that but then, you know, that you wouldn't actually probably experience an actual heating, like you a physical sensation. Most people wouldn't actually feel that or, or sense that. But that isn't necessarily the mechanism at work either. So I'm really kind of curious how you describe what's happening biologically to people when they're in the presence of, let's say, a, a, a strong, you know, EMF. Good question or comment because what has continued to move me along this course is what I think is the overwhelming evidence apart from just common sense, electromagnetic being, electromagnetic activity or like coming from the outside is going to influence. We've known that for many, many, many decades. And there are thermal effects and that was of course used early is that, well, there's some thermal effects, but there's no ionizing, non-ionizing, yeah. as if ionizing is bad and non is not bad. Like That's what we hear. Uh, most people's argument is they, it's the non-ionizing, ionizing, and the thermal effect. That's oftentimes, I would say, the comments that we see on our content are on t describing that spectrum. 
of ionizing and non-ionizing. One is safe, one is not. Yeah, they say exactly what you just said, as yeah. if non-ionizing just automatically means it's safe. Yeah, right. And that's and it, it's those assumptions. You know what happens when you make assumptions or you assume, but it's. I, I don't remember where I heard the phrase, non-ionizing doesn't mean it doesn't have effect. Everything has an effect. It's like when you look at that whole electromagnetic spectrum from the ultra low, I mean, it's kind of an over example, but earthquakes relatively low frequency, right? They got some problems. It can have, I, it, it's gonna cause a problem. It's not thermal. And then gamma, kind of, if, if you look at some purported extremes of that frequency. So, and as I've tried to look, I think there's good work, not just in the literature, in the environmental literature and the scientific and neuroscience literature, the effects of EMF. What are the cellular mechanisms? What is it doing at the cell level and in the cows and the different channels? And I think it makes sense scientifically. And I think we've known that. We've just never put it into a clinical context. Yeah. So usually what I'll say if people, and it, I don't get into that discussion often with ionizing, non-ionizing, where do you draw the line? What frequency, what wavelength? Boom, this is safe, this is not safe. So if you're hanging around this non-ionizing microwave i don't know you'll pick an analogy of something yeah. that's non ionizing and i think i may have said that before this may be not a, appropriate as the context here but when i'm introducing this with families i'm going over their qeg with them or their child and showing them these power spectral changes going on in the brain that may be related to the blue light effect that 400 to 450 nan nanometer wavelength stuff that we're dealing with or whatever I, that I show them along the spectrum, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, I don't have 6G on there yet, and where microwave ovens fit in. So there's a picture of a microwave and then there's a cell phone and there's these yeah. high towers. And usually, and now of course we've surpassed microwave spectrum with 5G 24 seven, another concern with millimeter waves and things. But I say to the, the, the the young person, um, I'm going to ask you a really scientific question. Are you supposed to stick your head in a microwave? The no doc, like <laughs> the well, look at the frequency bandwidth, ionizing or not, of microwaves. Look at the phones. Look at everything else that we're surrounded with, and we think it's not having an effect. And people that kind of help people begin to click when I try to. You try to contextualize it. But even then, there's still plenty of papers. It's all we're talking about. The only problem is thermal. And obviously, the phones don't cause any thermal effect. Anybody ever feel their phone get warm? I, I just, I don't, I don't understand the gap there. Yeah. Did that address? No, yeah. I think so. I think, uh, you know, when we look at the, the, the work with, Dr. Dogris, and you know, and and first of all, you know, I, I would mention that uh, he wasn't the first one that we worked with with the EEG stuff. Uh, you know, the the our product and company did a, has done a lot of testing for for many many years, and we just knew that it, that was an easy way to show the effects, the biological effects of a, of the phone, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were particularly tart, you know, working with the phone. We weren't really using anything else. All mm -hmm. of the room was filled with like five cameras and, and computers and it was lights and whatever else we had going VR on. VR stuff. Yeah, we had the VR stuff. So we had all kinds of things going on there. We just knew that would work, right? We had no doubts that it would work because we had done this study. We had done it ourselves, but also a lot of third party researchers, um, uh, that were looking over our research and stuff like that. This was, that was one of the tools they used as well. So, Th that didn't happen by accident. Like we knew that that was a great way to show first and foremost, the biological response to the presence of um, EMF. And, um, but so you see the brain change, you see stress or you see the things that are happening in the brain when the phone is next to the head. What is happening there? Is that a thermal, thermal effect? Is that something else that's going on there? What are your thoughts on that? 
it's probably both. I, it, they've showed some thermal effects when you look at thermography studies, like what Dr. Volkow did back in 2011 through the National Institutes of Health and published this stuff. And here we are more than a decade later and what's changed. So I think part of it's thermal, but just understanding field effect, it's much more than that. And so when I looked for changes in the EEG, which didn't show up as easily as they do in the quantitative EEG, because that's looking at dynamic changes, mm -hmm. what's called the spectral power and the connectivity of the brain. That comes from electromagnetic interference. And I, you probably don't remember, there was the old older days where you could take your cell phone, put it near the computer screen, and you would see a, a alteration or a warping yeah. of the picture from yeah. a magnetic effect. Yeah. And of course, now we're told that that's not a problem. We don't have to worry about it with all five or however many antennas are in each phone. But so yeah. I think it's an electromagnetic effect, and it gets back to the it's much easier to do a study and to publish it in acute or subacute effects. I don't think we need a whole bunch of studies when you look at the history back from radio wave sickness in the 50s and 60s, and even looking before, what electricity, electromagnetics do, can do in an adverse way to give us symptoms. And again, the brain, we do EEG, electroencephalogram, and we do MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging, even though the MRIs are great, but the MRIs aren't looking at brain activity. They're looking right. at blood. So the, the best way to look at the brain is EEG. It's so sensitive down to the millisecond. And as you saw with the quantitative EEG, with the, the imaging that you can do with Loretta and other things, it's called, you can get down to multiple millimeters as far as resolution, looking at the brain. But back to your, you know, there's the phone, but one of the, I've had these pivotal aha moments working with people through the years. One was a gentleman that had come in for neurofeedback. He was in 42, brilliant guy, wonderful guy, but worked all the time from his office. And his EEG had these left-sided little bursts, not seizures or anything, but it just was dysregulated. It wasn't harmonious like a lot of the rest of his EEG. And of course he used Bluetooth, so we, we started to talk about that, but his router was literally on this desk right next to where he sat eight, nine, 10 hours a day with that. Because that a coincidence? Left side, left-sided changes. He didn't think, I didn't think so. And he started making these changes, turning off the Wi-Fi router, distancing from where this, you're sleeping, things like that. Just basic stuff when I didn't even know about other ways to protect. Yeah. If this is a problem, if you keep going out in the sun and getting sunburn or having skin cancer, maybe you want to think twice about how often and how carefully you get exposed to that. And it dramatically, his anxiety decreased, his sleep improved. It, it, he, he was convinced because he experienced the changes and he got off the anxiety med that had been prescribed and stuff like that. So but back to is, I think it's a local effect, but chronically and now environmentally where how do we, besides living in a Faraday cage the rest of our years, how do we deflect, interfere, minimize the exposure in addition to distance and just implementing common sense stuff? Yeah. I like how you call it electromagnetic interference. I think that's a great word that we might want to use some more. <laughs> Um, it's just a great way of putting it, I think, because I feel like what you're describing is that the electromagnetic radiation is interfering with the normal function of your brain and other biological systems. Is that mm -hmm. kind of how you, how and why you use that term? I think so. It's, it's interfering because we're meant to function harmoniously. We're again, we're electromagnetic beings and when I pull up and look at an EEG, some of them just, we say, hum. You look and I just feel restful looking at the EEG. You see these well-modulated rhythms, fewer and fewer look that way. 
And so electromagnetic EMF is not the problem. Life is EMF. But when we introduce extraneous EMFs that don't come from natural sources, they can interfere with the natural electromagnetic functioning that we have. That's that's a I don't know. It I'm not a PhD, I'm not a physicist, I don't get this stuff like you do, but that's the way I try to think of it. But I'm something to interfere to help deflect. I mean, sunscreen is electromagnetic interference, right? I mean, sort of. <laughs> it's a yeah. blocker. But how do you, you you can wear you know your blue blocker glasses and you can um put your but it's more than blocking and and how do you block when there's if you live in a in a complex there's routers and stuff everywhere just drive down the average street and yeah. look at all the wireless that pop up so did that answer it, Millie, or did that address what you said? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I kind of think it leads into, we're not PhDs or physicists either on this side. So um, we're kind of on the same page there. I think you're a few steps up from us. But um, I think what we see, you know, is a lot of correlation. And I'm guessing that's how it started for you was seeing correlation between some of these issues and um, irregularities in your practice. How did it go from you deciding, no, this is actually a causation. I, this is something we need to isolate or treat for. The whole idea of ca causation Correlation doesn't imply causation. We've heard we hear that used all the time, and mm -hmm. but it might. So let's think about it. Yeah. My yeah. Approach. And often it came from this proverbial school of hard knocks. Like, and I think for me, the way when I was I was working with my wife and just trying to write down some ideas, but it uh, frustration with conventional neuroscience and neurology that if all the people that came to see me were getting better which is what we would like as healthcare providers then it wouldn't be a problem but when it was just a gradually awakening from the matrix it was like realizing i don't know it just made more sense that and then it, when you start looking at like, like getting back to what josh said about acute exposures and all the studies that i think are very conclusive the chronic the, the long-term issues with radiation exposure we get it if somebody lives next to a nuclear plant that melts down or is getting constantly radiated but there's a whole spectrum and so um i think i got off track millie no i mean i think the track you're going down is good i think that we think about the spectrum a lot i think that I agree with you that, you know, correlation does not equal causation is something that it's kind of beat into our heads a lot, especially if you take a statistics class, you know, like everybody has to in college. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that that gets kind of used as an argument as to why it's not proven or can't be, you know, determined as unsafe. And as we know, the burden of proof is kind of unfortunately on the wrong side in this situation of instead proving that it's not safe when it should be proving that it is safe um so i think the that that's kind of yeah. sorry yeah. go ahead the, the precautionary principle yes yeah exactly First, yeah. so i think your point about you know but it might be is you know you're seeing signs that it might be and i think what you're saying is yeah to be precautionary there's a a quote, and I've used it with you before. I'll just read it real quick. It's, it was actually from the early 1800s. And it said, there's a principle, this gets into the causation and correlation type of thing. And you said it's often used as an argument or misused as an argument. It's cause, correlation doesn't imply causation. Yeah. So let's talk about, could it be correlated because we're always looking particularly in pediatrics when kids come in with this stuff going on in their head and they've had a kidney transplant and stuff going on in their heart how can this all tie in together and it's getting to be a little scary but this quote says there is a principle 
which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a person in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. It's the don't confuse me with the facts or, yeah. oh, yeah, I know all about that and it's not real or whatever. And that's when I just say, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. I've got things to do and I'm not interested in fighting and I'm not interested in selling anything except trying to get keep me healthy, keep my family healthy, get the world healthier. And I just feel like we're missing the biggest influence. You know, I always talk about moving, eating, disconnecting, sleeping, but I spend most of the time on the disconnecting because that influences the eating. Yeah. You know, and then getting back to susceptible populations without keeping guilt, because that's guilt. How, how, how well does that work as a motivator in today's world? But with families, getting them to be aware. Um, and I haven't gotten in trouble so far. It's been good conversations. Like when I work with colleagues in the hospital, one day we were doing a conference and two of the intensivists, incredible people were pregnant and they both had their iPads right there. And I just leaned over nicely and said, don't radiate your baby. And it was kind of, and we have a good, we can do this. We have a good yeah. relationship. And that led to the discussion. Let's look at this. And it was like, oh, and then when you look at the penetration, this computer program that we're working at that shows depth of penetration with 5G or whatever the frequency, the energy depth is, it's a concern. I don't know how I got off on that again, other than no, I, I it's think so obvious once you're here, but people have to be willing to have a dialogue to wake up from the matrix. Mm -hmm. I, I love what you said about the just the, the quote that you had there, because it feels like that's our every day. So we, that's what we deal with every single day. Um, it is. And that was actually the first written back in the early 1800s. It got famous again back in the 40s because they put it in the so-called Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so it's in there, but it's true for all of us as humans. Yeah. Don't confuse yeah. me with the fact, contempt prior to investigation yeah i i and we see that in counterculture and cancel culture and whatever else yeah so, i want to be respectful of your time and so i would I, I think let's ask maybe one or two more questions one thing that's on my mind is not everyone's willing to listen to this conversation which still to me is goes to what we just talked about but it's still a little surprising uh because it does seem fairly obvious it, when you really take a step back and you take yourself out of the you know, the, the the bubble a bit and you, and you look at kind of what we're doing and with the technology, it does seem obvious, but it, but it actually isn't to a lot of people. If you were to say, you know, the every the average person, the everyday person that isn't, let's say, um, EHS, uh, who do you think should be paying more attention? It, we think a lot about, I'll tell you kind of I'm leading a little bit here, we, you know, we've really kind of identified some of our audience and people that we think are um, probably a good place to start, but, but people that, the couples that are trying to conceive uh, mm -hmm. is, a, is a good one. Uh, 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 a recently, um, you know, pregnant mother is probably another one. Young, you know, newborns and infants and, and adolescents, you know, kids um, is another one. And then I would say that's kind of on, on the family side. And then on the other side of it, we're thinking people that want to, you know, optimize sleep or just optimize cognitive performance, kind of more on that biohacking, you know, human mm -hmm. optimization side, you know, we're, we kind of, you know, look at them mostly because they're open to like the biohacking community is open to really any conversation that's like, well, let's test that. Let's take a look at that. What are we yeah. missing? You know, and so we really like that audience because they can help push science forward through a lot of experimentation that's outside of what's acceptable. Um, and so we really like that. But from your point of view, who do you think should should exercise more caution? Like what groups of people or you know segments do you think? My first answer, which isn't a great one, is anybody who has a brain. <laughs> it, but you've addressed not just the susceptible group, but the, the vulnerable. I mean, we're all vulnerable as humans. 
I think it's important for people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, although that's although we're aging up, a generation yeah. has not grown up saturated. I I believe the evidence shows dramatic increase in infertility on both female and male sides. And you know the spermatogenesis studies and all the stuff going on there. There has to be a reason for that. And there's probably a multi-factor multiple factors related, but uh, I think the people that are going to hear it are the ones that are, are ready to hear. Some of us won't hear it until we're hurting enough, until there's enough going on that says, white flag, I need help, and or I've tried this, 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 and then they seek out something outside their traditional system because they're not getting those answers in the medical establishment. I would love to see this as a common denominator in the medical profession. And yeah. how long has it taken? I remember back if you, I do that in some of the presentation, but in the 20s, 30s, 40s, it was my profession, primarily the medical profession that was promoting smoking. It was safe, it was good for you, it had health promoting quality, you know, all the stuff that we look back now a hundred years and go, idiots, that was ridiculous. Yeah. That was science, it was published, and now we know, but it took till the 50s, really, in the early 60s, for the Surgeon General and all that stuff, and I'm not picking on anybody smoking and all that, It's it's, but it we know the dangers of smoking, and yet how many billions of cigarettes and now smoke, whatever, all these yeah. devices we're still knowing doesn't change but here knowing begins to change i mean we can hear this stuff and say oh yeah this is a problem please put me back insert me back into the matrix i'm not ready for yeah. this and so so i you've touched on those people one somebody who's willing to listen but younger people childbearing age developing kids, the developing brain, which by the way, the myelinated tracks in the brain, certain tracks are still myelinating in their late in the late 20s. So when does that developmentally susceptible brain go away? I think it's always there. And I, I still think many, many of the cognitive declining dementia symptoms that we're seeing are a combination of EMF, sleep, sleep environment, and gut let alone just all the toxicities in the world. A good friend of mine is on a pesticides board um, and deals a lot with pediatrics. I mean, look at our, our world. So how do we get healthier to cause interference <laughs> with stuff we're bringing into our bodies yeah. to make it healthier? Yeah. Well, that's good. I, I, uh, I think the, the development, the, 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 developing brain that you mentioned and just the and you think about pregnancy pre-pregnancy infants newborns that whole the amount of growth that takes place in such a short amount of time that compressed mm -hmm. timeline and like the, i loved it when you were talking about the 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 woman in your office and saying don't radiate your baby um i mean that's there's that's such a literal thing like it's actually it seems so obvious right uh, but that group where you know that we just talked about, there's so much development occurring in such a compressed timeline that the caution should be exercised, Le even for so many different reasons. But there's just too much evidence to suggest that you shouldn't ignore it. Like you, you shouldn't ignore that. I think when we see, like again, the 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 people that I would say are having conversations with us. Uh, through our content and and whatnot, um, a lot of people challenge the science. Why do you think the challenge, the science is challenged so much uh, around? I mean, I think the World Health Organization recently said that I think it was there twenty or twenty or thirty thousand studies have been peer reviewed studies have been submitted to them on this topic, the negative effects of uh, EMF. That so much that they they are trying to aggregate it in a way, and they have a whole model of how they're trying to aggregate this information. And you know, say what you want about the the World Health Organization. That's not the point. The point is, is just the um, sheer amount and volume of t studies and research going to this category. But yet, there's still so many people that are unwilling to listen or challenge it and say it's bad science. 
why do you think it's what's your opinion on why you think it's being challenged so much and when you've had conversations with people in your office do you see them react negatively to the like i don't i'm not going to believe that stuff that's tinfoil hat conspiracy theory stuff do you get that reaction occasionally yes and I just keep trying to present a framework to say, <clears throat> here's where you've been, here's the symptoms, these things haven't worked, here's what may be a plausible explanation, correlative or causative, and it's the only thing that's put that together. And here's a way you can keep doing the same thing over and over, keep trying to use prescribed medicines or whatever, and and often when couples would come in there was typically more of a discrepancy the mom may be more getting it more understanding and the, the husband i loved it when i had engineers and sh shortly before the practice closed we had three in separate people that had worked at nasa scientists mm -hmm. Um, one with Parkinsonism that we were helping with neurofeedback and things, but it was, you could have that conversation. I'm not trying to present myself as an engineer, PhD, brilliant person with them, but it's say, here's the information. And even with that, there's people that will still adopt contempt prior to some investigation. I mean, you yeah. need really open-minded. I need to be willing to look at the negative versus the positive correlative papers. But the amount of evidence, and, and Melly, we emailed kind of about that, when I keep my accumulating file called my EMR, or my EMF file, it's unbelievable. And even if it's all not real, something's going on and maybe yeah. we should be cautious about this. But often people aren't ready to, I wasn't having that conversation unless they were coming to my office for whatever symptom it wasn't just for seizures obviously that is more and i think that's the part that has been the, the hardest part of the last couple of years is when i go to the various hospitals i'm exhausted i'm freaked out during the weeks day and night with the amount of calls particularly younger and younger people and it's not and i think there's good studies showing the increased instance of seizures and epilepsy in the world even though that's still not party line. Epilepsy is still considered, oh, it's always been there. It's the sacred disease. It'll always be there. It's kind of whatever. But to me, it plausibly makes sense that the developing, the incredible miracle going on in this developing baby when all those neurons and the white matter tracks are trying to work against incredible forces to develop a body, a human being and there's enough influences against that as well and then we throw that in with other stuff um, i don't know i'm getting off on a tangent there but it's there's a lot we can do and i'm i'm glad from getting to know you you're not just selling a product right it's, it is it's yes you're selling a product everybody has to have a business but if it doesn't come with education and awareness that goes with it, um, I don't know. It's hard when I still see people that choose to seem to ignore the obvious in many things. And it's like, oh, we can have this later. Go have a nice day. Yeah. Do stuff because there's plenty of people that are willing to say, here, I'm having this problem. How can I help? Yeah. No, I think that was good. I don't think I think that was an appropriate, you know, response too, because you know you you addressed everything that I kind of thought was occurring. And I actually was just curious if you know you're coming from a place of you're a doctor, you're trying to help, and you ha you're reading it, you have data from them. And I part of me was just curious if you still got people that were pushing you back and saying, "No, that's not you know that's not true." And I, I'm just curious if that would still happen. It sounds like it happens, you know, occasionally. Uh, okay, and and probably um, a lot of those people aren't making it to me because my yeah. availability now is different than when i was in practice when we were seeing patients all through the day it's now people who by word of mouth find out and want to have a dialogue to um yeah uh, <laughs> somebody wants to have a dialogue millie 
<laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say, we didn't talk about this before when we first started, but on our very first conversation, you referenced this kind of collection of work that you've compiled around EMF and EMR. And it's probably the most impressive collection I've ever seen. And we, I mean, I was just so excited when I saw that because you were so well prepared. And this is like, I said, it's only a, a sliver of, of the work that you're doing, but it was just so, there was so much depth to it and of just all, everything you've compiled and collected. And, and, you, and you just, and I don't know, I, it was impressive. And so I love talking with you because you have so many different reference points, different studies, you, you've read the work, you've, and you've done the, you've actually done the work, which a lot of people never do. They'll read the headline, they'll get the bullet point summary, or they'll, someone told me this or whatever. They have never even done the research themselves. You showed up in our first you know conversation with just a mountain of, research that you had researched that you had spent the time organized it summarized a lot of it and have spent a lot of time clearly a lot of time thinking about it uh mm -hmm. and have real world you, you know experiences with it too and i think that made it unique we, like we talked about this before we have a lot of people that, that contact us a lot of people that want to work with us and it's hard for us to filter through all of that because we don't we don't really know and we want to be very careful who we align ourselves with because it is a tricky topic and and you and there's a lot of people that haven't done the work or have had the real world experience that you've had implementing you know different tactics and and um the different advice that you give the people to to just Im improve the 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 experiences that they're having so um we i do really appreciate the time millie was there anything that I mean, I have a lot more, but I feel like there's going to be a part two. I feel like we have to have a part two. I've kind of collected some more questions that I want to research first so I can ask better questions. But anything that you felt like we we should cover that that we didn't? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you have it, go for yeah. it. <laughs> Matt, you've done a good job staying awake. Thank you. This is, uh, yeah. <laughs> when you were saying that, uh, Josh, I for me, coming with a mountain of stuff, I didn't come to you to show you all this stuff. It no, was like, yeah. hey, this is cool. I want to make another connection to give people some hope because yeah. people are getting increased. When we lose hope, it's over. You know, that's why I talk about prescribing health and and hope, things like that. But desperation and dedication, a lot of my dedication comes out of desperation and going into the hospitals and seeing those it, it's happening all the time, all over the world, more and more sick kids, especially the seizures in younger and younger kids, more MRI abnormalities we're seeing far more. And it's not just because our MRIs are better, but seeing developmental problems, it's something's going on. You know, it, it, around Chernobyl, somebody finally said, something's going on <laughs> mm -hmm. and they, once you get it to some conscious level, the awareness can happen, but desperation and dedication. And it's that's what's led to keep looking at papers and looking for people around the world who you can connect with who say, I'm not content with the status quo. I can't just prescribe, cut out a part of the brain and call it a day and then just keep reinventing the wheel and seeing kids on their 10th and 12th and 15th anti-seizure drug, for example. It's just... It's not working. Yeah. So. I loved your point about hope because I feel like, you know, it can get really gloomy. Um, in reading the research, it, when you find out about it, even in just a passing sentence, it can seem very gloomy that you have to get rid of the technology that you love. And so I think your point about hope that I think you put this in your notes, but just about, you know, being aware is the first step and then figuring out how to take action from there. Um, well, and I, for the practice, we adopted hope, health, healing. We don't do a very good job in healthcare today of healing, but that is possible for many things. Hope, most of the people that would come to see us are relatively hopeless. Yeah. And they get through this. And again, when we lose all hope, that's when people off it, you know, it's done. But to give people, okay, here's a vestige of hope. And it's not some new little 
invest in this and spend this money here and you'll be happy forever after it's there is there's got to be hope because it's increasingly hopeless if we're doing the same thing so hope get them a vision of what health looks like and that's different than what we've been ad hearing for a long time you know, electromagnetic health what are you talking about that's yeah. you know and then that he better healing is possible and it hasn't come on a large scale through chemical manipulation and things like that. So, yeah. And in yeah. fact, a friend just emailed, and I haven't read it yet, but there was an article just published today in Nature. And I know we're getting off again, but it was in Nature, kind of a predominant journal, but basically, finally looking at the reality issues of serotonin not necessarily being the key link with depression and maybe that's why the medication solution from a serotonin anyway without getting into far i'm not paid by any pharmaceutical or any or you or anybody else but it's every once in a while this stuff surfaces that maybe there's more going on from a electromagnetic standpoint than there is from a chemical standpoint so anyway yeah, we didn't even talk about, we talked, we, we you know, spent all, all of our time really talking about humans. We didn't even touch on insects, animals, you know, oh. plants, and <laughs> get to that depressing side, that, that, and that's an area where, you know, Aries and the, its original kind of iteration, it was originally, you know, dedicated to solving a, a human problem, uh, but over the years, I, I don't know how many studies or how much research has been dedicated to specific to animals and plants, bees in particular, uh, which is a, an area that that I think we a lot of us on the team are super interested in, in continuing to, to dive deeper in. But uh, yeah, the electromagnetic fields is, is, it can be a real depressing topic. And so the idea of being able to provide some hope, because it is fairly simple, like there are some simple things you can do to just just give your your body a rest in between mm -hmm. these moments. We, you mentioned distance a lot. You mentioned turning off, you know, your electronics routers in particular. Don't put that stuff in your bedroom. So while you are recharging, there are some basic things. That, is there anything else that you think of that you feel like if hey here's your here's your little note card of things to do right now? Um, and I'm not thinking any products or anything like that. I'm just thinking like when people leave your office, you're like here the here's the note card version of what you should do. Well, I, I think I've showed you, I have a handout that I would do on, I would give them four sheets of paper, one on M, moving, activity, mobility, E, the brain gut, eating. With, I'm not selling diets. I didn't recommend specific this diet or that diet, but just look at basic principles of brain gut nutrition, disconnecting. I would go over not just screen time, not just the physical time, but the electromagnetic characteristics of the screens and then the whole stuff that we've talked about. And then so when you sleep. say disconnecting, it's not just about like logging out of apps. Like a lot of times people say disconnect, like I'm just, I'm disconnecting from the alerts and contact with the outer world. You're saying disconnecting completely, like physically removing yourself from the, the electronics. As much as possible. I yeah. mean, there's a whole, a whole overwhelming evidence on what social media is doing. Right, and right. Telling people to disconnect from their social accounts. And I've never been much in them. I think I have a Facebook account. I, I, it, so I'm not against that. But And healthy people can use things in healthy ways. But um, it's, I don't know where I was going with that. But that's what I mean from the disconnect. Yeah. It's not to turn it off. It's realizing when you put your phone on airplane mode or whatever, it's still doing stuff. When yeah. you it's being aware of that type of environment. There was one other thing you were saying that, that really clicked, but now I can't. Oh, oh, oh. So one of the other things I would do is an analogy with families. And if I was using some PowerPoints for teaching, I'd say, we have known, and most people have heard this over the last 10 years. I think it was 2014, National Geographic did a documentary on the migratory patterns of birds being affected by our human made electromagnetic world mm -hmm. 10 years or whatever ago or more. So most of us 
it's taught, I think, in some schools in science class that we are affecting not just with our environmental pollution, but electromagnetic pollution, migratory patterns of birds, mammals, things like that to some extent. And if we think that it affects animals and it doesn't affect us as humans, yeah. and then that would make the suggestion that I haven't seen a bird with a Bluetooth on yet today. <laughs> I haven't, I don't know, I don't go see bear dens very often, but I haven't seen a bear with a wireless hub in their den you know they're not in immediate vicinity and yet they're being affected mm -hmm. and we as even more intensive electromagnetic beings we're not being affected so yeah. and so just little things that would say okay i get that but we need hope i mean it's like once people realized that what was going on with chernobyl it seems hopeless there's got to be hope or just forget it you know let's what can we do to stop the damage and to restore health to what has been damaged yeah well good millie anything else i don't i think that's a great place to leave it like you said i think there will definitely need to be a part two i have yeah. i have more questions a lot of things got brought up that i think we could expand on and go deeper on too but really thank you so much for your time and for sharing your thoughts it's it's affirming for us to hear and i hope that it will you know we'll be able to spread this in a good way so that it will help other people too yeah i think it'll be interesting to see what matt can do with that because i i don't think of what i do at a big level of but people talk about that all the time why don't you write a book why don't you get courses out there and I don't see myself as that person, but it's, you know, teaching, taking somebody fishing or teaching them how to fish that whole, how do we get it? And that's what you're trying to do. And now you, you're, you're, you have a worldwide platform. Yeah. It, it, because this is a worldwide issue. Yeah. And well, it's, it's crazy just how technology has, evolved so much that just little snippets and things like that can reach millions of people mm -hmm. it's ridiculous um so so i'm hoping that i mean even for me since i'm so new to this stuff mm -hmm. um, and still trying to learn and understand it's so intriguing um it's so intriguing to to hear how how people how little people know about um how big of a change things could have on your body you yeah. know especially on things that you use every day. So. Mm -hmm. And that's, it does, it, it applies. That's neat. And you're beginning to experience that and see that it doesn't mean you're switching professions and getting out of your major and, you know, no, it's, it's like, it's being able, being able to, to use what you love and what you have in a healthier way. Yeah, exactly. That you mm -hmm. should quote Matt. That was it. That was right there. There's our sound bite. <laughs> but that's that's healthcare. Use what right. we can, and I've been doing this in healthcare forty years, and I love this kind of a dialogue. You guys have been very patient. I didn't know I chew your ear for an hour and a half, but it's, it's so much weird. learning it keeps me going because I I can't live in the matrix, and no one can. To be honest, <laughs> Pardon? you're this this treasure trove of information that. Yeah unless you are in that environment or someone is seeing you at a, you know, patient doctor environment, a lot of it doesn't get shared. Um, I would like to, if we're going to take notes, maybe for a round two, I would like to learn more about this, um, that depth of penetration that you guys are doing. I think that sounds very interesting. Um, that's a, a big one that came to my mind that popped right. out. And I can show that graphically with this and I'll, we're I'm working with an incredible clinician in Vancouver who's it's a great little simple program you just you can plug in the frequency or the wavelength it, that all deals with the energy what we're talking about is energy right we're energetic beings and energy can be a good thing energy can be a bad thing but the the depth the strength of the energy is what determines how deep it penetrates it's the difference mm -hmm. between gamma or millimeter waves you know so it is that's that would be fun to talk about and yeah. i can show you some of those pictures 
what it looks like. You plug in a simple three gigahertz, something like in a 5G, and it calculates the wavelength, which is easy, and then the energy, and you can show how deep that penetrates, five or six centimeters into the human on our front and back if it's all over the place into our brains. And as I look at that, it's like, why are we wondering what's going on? Let's mm -hmm. do something about this. And it's not anti-5G. It's not a saying it's a conspiracy and all those things. It's like, it's here. We've got to live with it. What are we going to do about it? So thank you, Kate. Yeah. Well, we, 5G is a big topic for us, especially, you know, the timing of it. Um, we have a lot of messages and stories in sharing a lot of education around 5G and the strength and the harm. Um, with that, you know, we've we've talked about distance. So I think that we also have a lot to say around the proximity of how, where and how you place your products and the yeah. proximity to that, that radiating device, um, where those EMFs are stemming from. And, yeah. and how the strength of our product works and, and how that correlates. So I think that even, that all ties together. I want to hear more about that at some point too. So yeah. we know, so when I have one of the devices here on the computer, one around my neck, you know, yeah. one over there, kind of in the center of our little little small condo. But yeah. it's for, for geographical distance, sometimes I feel like it's telling somebody around Chernobyl, I hate to keep picking on that, Put your bedroom on the other side of the house. Okay, that's good, but what can we do? So I, I want to learn that too, because I want to. People are asking questions. What we hear all this. Thanks a lot, Doc, for opening me up to this stuff. Sheesh, now what do I do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you see, know, this, Kaylin always says, once you know, like you can't, you can't unknow it. it. You can't unknow yeah. it. Now. Never ring the bell. You can't. Yeah, we. Uh, I've been traveling a lot on the airplanes, and airplanes are to me are just fascinating because you look at just that you're in this metal tube of, of, uh, EMFs, you know, essentially. And it's like, it's kind of crazy. And you think about oh. everyone's willing to accept, you know, all the different kind of physical change that occur in your body when you fly, when you travel and there's jet lag and all that. And it's all, there's a lot going on there between pressurizing and elevate. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And then you throw in the, this strength and presence of so much electromagnetic field uh, in there. It's, it's kind of crazy. More and more intense. But you I, pay attention now. My point was you pay attention. You walk oh, to the yeah. airport, Dude. you walk downtown, you pay attention, you know? I thought one of, one of my last old man sort of problems is through the years, I never understood why seat belts were not mandated on school buses. I don't know if you knew that growing up or you had that issue. And I remember when seeing when school buses in South Carolina started wireless on board. Hmm. You can't put a seatbelt on because that's not safe. Yeah. But we can have wireless have in the wireless. Bus. Yeah. Hey, you go for it. It's like, okay. That's crazy. I did not know that school buses were getting Wi Fi. That's oh, yeah. Some have. I don't know how many. Yeah. But have you ever seen a school bus that enforced seatbelts on every seat? No. Yeah, no. Like, but if you're driving and you get pulled over and your seatbelt's not on, you can get a ticket. Yeah. Unless you're in a government authorized school bus. That's different. Yeah. I don't know. So well, just, let's look at these inconsistencies and have a dialogue and say, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you've been gracious with your time. Um, we'll you follow up. And, and any any edits something like that will run by you so you can kind of get you know get a get a taste of of you know what we're doing and what our thoughts are and, and as we mentioned you know this is um I, i'm excited about what came out of today and the conversation that took place and you know the opportunity we have to amplify that and, and reach you know a lot of people with it and and i'm hoping more than anything there's some virality that we're able to create uh where people are sharing it amongst each other that means they really like it, it means they're voting for this type of conversation um and so i'm, I'm really you know, excited about what comes out of that. I don't know exactly what our follow-up time will be because we've got a lot of questions with internally of what we're going to do. Um, but I do think I would love to, do, I think the next time we have a conversation, I would love to do it in person um, and, you know, maybe do a video or something like that. We'll come a little better prepared. We'll give you a heads up. Um, and, and I think there's some areas that I would love to just kind of go a little deeper on, you know, in particular that will come from this, but we'll keep you, you know, updated. 
anything that we can do for you though, I, I tell the team all the time, like, like, uh, uh, Dr. Turner has been so, is so great to talk to so much fun. We learned so much. What can we do for him? <laughs> like, so if there's anything that we can do for you, if we can send you more product, we can, whatever we can do, please do not hesitate. We want to, you know, be a good partner, be a good friend. And, you know, we're on, we're fighting the same fight. And so please let us know what we can do for you at any time. And I know you're not trying to sell anything, promote anything, but if you ever do, let us know because <laughs> we want to help with that. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I really appreciate the time. I do. I, and I have had fun, probably more fun than you guys, but this has been, I enjoy doing this dialogue. And I think Katie, my wife, who I think you've met. Briefly, yeah, we met her. Yeah. Um, sent an email about, you know, our, what our oldest daughter and our, our kids have wonderfully adopted many things in spite of me through the years. Yeah. yeah. The stuff we've suggested. So I think she had in an email something recently about some stuff for Mandy, our oldest daughter. Yeah. And she has tremendous connectivity with parents all over, especially those that are in the adoptive world and things like that. So that would be neat. And in person would be fun. And, yeah. Um, figure out what that would look like at some point. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm learning. I think one of the other bucket lists would be at some point being able to meet with some of the scientific folks and just. Yeah. I, want to wrap my head and I don't think I can because I'm not PhD quality but it's like it it's it's there how do we envision it visualize it and translate that because yeah. it it makes so much sense so it's one of these days how this I've been whole thinking around the idea and I, and I don't know how this would come I don't know how it's gonna play out yet but when I think of doing it in person I would love to get uh you know Dr. Dogris together yourself uh, Dr. Matrovsky, who's on our board, he's based in Canada, but he's one of the experts in the in the in the field uh, mm -hmm. for EMF. It's specific to, um, I mean, he's he's who I think it was that there was a big big lawsuit in Canada uh, with the telecommunications industry, and um, I can't remember the other party, but but the the negative effects that these telephone poles and this stuff that they're doing was having on the environment, and he's the expert witness that's called. And, and so he's on our board, he's fantastic, but getting a group of people together, doing maybe a panel, some individual conversations, but more so to see you guys interact <laughs> and have that conversation and then take us out of it. But um, I'm trying to figure out how that play out. Uh, and you know, as, as COVID slowly unwinds and everyone has a different experience, especially because Matrovsky's in Canada and that's a whole nother oh. craziness of, of yeah. things going on there. Um, trying to have to coordinate it all, but um, we have we do have access to some great great minds and great people that I think, and everyone's kind of asking the same things, <laughs> like like a lot of people because you know now Nick has been seen by millions of people, really? and everyone, yeah, contacting us and saying, hey, we want to interview the doctor, and like, well, he's he's not on our staff, call him, like we <laughs> called him, I didn't know him before I called him, you know, so um, yeah, he, I mean, I think the video uh yeah i don't know how many millions of people now had he, he's that's been out to but it's millions of people around the world so uh mm -hmm. it, anyways I, I we have a lot of people that have seen that or are familiar with the work that we've done the before the product hit the market though as, as well there was about a three-year period where the product was just sent to all sorts of researchers doctors all around the world to just test it and we needed it to be reviewed and so we have at the time we weren't really allowed to interact with them but now that that's all done we've had the idea of like can we now go talk to all of them and see what they learn um because every like every bank or every um you know because we're a public company every um brokerage that would promote us would send their own research teams to investigate the product to test the product and so there's quite a large group of people that have had the product in their hands put it in their labs, done whatever they've done with it. And all of them came back with the stamp of approval to yes, we'll, we'll get behind this product. Mm -hmm. We want to reach out to those people and, and say, what did you learn? What did you see? Cause we didn't get to see any of it. We can't use any of it. It wasn't for us. It was for these other parties to just validate the product was, was good. Yeah, but that's huge. And th there's a, a segment of, of anybody involved with Aries tech that's reaching out. It's going to, 
want to see that. And in spite yeah. of all the scientific validity that's there, the reliability and validity of the data, there's always going to be people who are, you know, contempt prior to investigate. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. And if eventually those conversations happen if they if people are hurting bad i don't want people to hurt yeah but sometimes that's what it takes to say okay maybe i'm ready to have a different discussion yeah so yeah. we need an emf junket yeah <laughs> well cool we'll keep you updated though like i said we want to keep keep uh keep stay close and continue to have some conversation make any connections that we can you know with you and for you uh but like i said if there's anything we can do for you please let us know and if anybody does i'm I don't know how far your Katie's through it. Do you want to say hi? Just say quickly. Yeah. Let's say hi to Katie. <laughs> hi. 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 You've been listening in the background. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I was wondering. I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll probably hear from you after we celebrate our 40th anniversary. Next. Oh, in congrats. A Congratulations. What, what day? August 7th. I'm yeah. August 5th. I'm August 5th for 22 years. Wow. Well, like August what? August 5th, 22 yes. years. Yeah. Isn't that amazing. For you. Yep. Yeah. So that's uh that's cool. So are you guys going somewhere? Do you have plans? Well, we were gonna make the whole Switzerland meeting oh, part of right. that, but we just we but uh the the kids that aren't in town are coming in, the grandkids are here. We're gonna get on a boat that just in the Charleston Harbor for yeah. two nights, just kind of like a bed Airbnb Perfect. or yeah. Mm -hmm. Just hang out in Charleston, which is where people come to vacation. Yeah, we get to live here, so yeah, yeah. that's what I, we're gonna do. Well, I went this, for the first time last Savannah. year. It was beautiful. I loved it. Yeah, you honeymooned in Savannah. Did we're you headed. That we're gonna. We'll be in Savannah for our anniversary. Um, okay, so we'll be nearby. Yeah. Just wave and say hi. I will. I will. Send an ele electromagnetic wave. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You guys, you guys are asking if there is anything you could do for for Rusty. Yeah, you may have talked about this. Maybe I just didn't hear. Um, are you going to use clips from today? Matt, Matt, this is something? Matt. He's doing the editing and things. And well, so go ahead. I mean, yeah. that would be something good to put on your website, right? If you, if yeah, you we're almost to the point of. To I haven't used had a website for two years since the practice closed, and we're finally coming up. But I would love to figure out how to make that work mm -hmm. yeah there's we get interaction we'll help you we can any, help. yeah and anything yeah. anything we get we'll make sure to get to you guys too yeah yeah we we typically you know we we always kind of operate like we want to be treated how we want to treat you how we want to be treated and re, i will tell you we had an, a situation where some really terrible journalist wrote an article about our product and about he called it the scammy scammy like dark world of 5g or emf protection or something like that and wrote this really horrible article about it had a lot to do with us he had never talked to us never called us but put a bunch of quotes in oh, from no. dimitri the the ceo and founder and but i think he was getting them from like press releases i don't i don't even know if they're real quotes but he made it look like he actually interviewed us and actually had a conversation and knew something about our company and I wrote a response, you know, tried to contact him, like, hey, let's have a real conversation. Let's strap you up and put the, you know, the, the machine on your head. You can try for yourself. And um, he never responded. But I just didn't like that feeling of like, oh, it was you horrible. You've been, you've been violated. I mean, it's- Yeah, it's and it was like, and you're spreading this. And it was through a publication that has a really large reach. And it was just like, this guy doesn't know anything about us. And he's referencing, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of bad players in our category of product. There's no doubt there's bad players. And there was a large um, class action or or FTC something like 15 years ago. I mean, it was a long, long time ago. People selling the patches on the back of the phones and things like that, which I don't really know anything about. They work, they don't work. I have no idea. But that's not us. That's not what we're doing. And we, we, we are on a, a whole different, like, mission than you know people that are trying to you know grab sell a product make a lot of money but he put us in that group of people and just the, it was just really bad so my point is is like since that moment and even before and i think we we're all operated this way anyways is just to really ensure that you're happy with the final you know product whatever is out there because it's important to us that you feel good about it and you're represented the way that you want to be represented 
So we will for sure make sure that you you know, give your stamp of approval on anything. We'll make sure that you have the, whatever files. We can help you with the website in any way that you need. Whatever you need, let us know because that's what we do. I mean, we're, for the most part, all marketers. Millie's the smart one that does reads the research and writes and stuff like that. But the rest of us are, we're marketers and storytellers and, and you know, bu growth, build, you know, building businesses. That's kind of what we do. So, um, but we all kind of came together because we're really passionate about what we're doing. And, you know, we brought this kind of group of, of people together to, to, to really work on this and work on this company. So we just want to make sure that you, you get value and you're represented well. So like I said, keep us, keep us informed on your website. Uh, when you get to that point, if you need help with the website, um, in any way, let us know, we'll make sure that you have the files that you can upload them and you're able to play them on the website, whatever you need from us, we'll do. And I also think, you know, we would love to, when you get the website up and I don't, you know, I, I don't know if it's just informative or if there's any, I don't know what the website, your point of your website will be necessarily, but I don't we, either. That's, yeah, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, we have a large email database and I think what would be really great too is not only we have this audio content, but if there's any sort of writings that you have blog posts or things like that, that, or maybe we maybe give you a topic, um, that we could publish on ours, you can publish on yours, but we can blast it out to our email, you know, database. And, uh, that's a really good way to get a lot of eyeballs real quick, you know, a lot of traffic and things like that. But, but we also love the content as well. Like we, we want the content to be able to share with, with the world. So that's another thing. I think we have a lot, you know, a lot of ways to collaborate with you and support and whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah, cool. Sounds good. And I'm sorry, you were the victim. We heard contempt prior to investigation. There's also the phenomenon of publication prior to investigation. <laughs> yes. That. And we are living in the age of that for sure. And people don't, you know, they, oh, I read blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, okay. Well, thank you. Anything else, guys? Time. We'll wrap it up. Yeah. We'll stay in touch. Um, yeah. yeah. And if and anybody we, reads this, let me know. I please. wanted, I was going to ask Invisible Rainbow, right? Yeah. Okay. It's, really it's, very, it's very readable. It's yeah. fun. It's, I mean, it's really thick, but it, it's, it's, it is very readable. It's not like a textbook. And he's got one, it, the history, the samples, the line of thought. It will just strengthen even more the last third yeah. or last oh, quarter. Is. Yeah, like last quarter is bibliography and references. Okay. Unbelievably well done. It was Public, and I didn't hear about it till this colleague friend told me, and it was just republished or re-edited. It's like a, not an edition, but updated in 2020. I think it was first published in 2016. So I'm pretty impressed so far. I think you are too. Yeah. So, cool. Good. We'll have to look at. We appreciate that. Thank you yeah. so much again. We'll talk soon. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.